Well, good morning, and welcome to Grace Harvest Bible Church. Turn in your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 6. We open up this great epistle again this morning as we conclude with uh, this chapter uh, of the book of Romans, Romans chapter 6. I titled this sermon this week, Who is Your Master? And as Jesse said earlier, I pray that you come back this evening for a time of uh, hear God's word again proclaimed out of the Old Testament, the book of Jeremiah, is that correct, Pastor? Uh, tonight and then we will have uh, questions uh, about that sermon and then um, we will fellowship have a fellowship time of dessert together so uh, I look forward to that tonight and uh, go home get a good nap I, I could keep you here till about five and let you go home for, no okay I won't go New Testament on you then right with Paul so in in this book that we have been spending so much time in and I, I pray that that God is working in your life that if you have dealt with all of us have dealt with sin in our life and one of the things I heard Paul Washer say this week in the paradox of our faith he said when you come to Christ he said, remember when you came to Christ and you and how joyful you were that the sin that you had committed had been forgiven and you looked at God's grace and you thought, well, what, with what joy that you had in your life because of that grace. But I feel, just as Paul Washer does, the closer I get in my sanctification, the closer I get to that day that I will be, be glorified when I die and I leave this world behind and I I'm, see my Savior face to face. I, I look at my sin now and it, it grieves me more than it did when I first came to saving faith. My sin breaks me like it never did before. And yet the paradox is I look at Christ and I see the grace that covers that very depraved sin in my heart. And so we as Christians can always grieve for our sin but rejoice in a Savior who loves us. When God saved His people from Egypt, He saved them physically, did He not? He took them out of the land of Egypt. And what happened to the Old Testament physically, we can apply spiritually to our lives in the New Testament times. The story of the Israelites leaving Egypt and going to the Promised Land is a physical example of how we spiritually leave sin, which is our Egypt. We leave sin. with a, We rejoice that we're free, just as the Israelites rejoice that they were free from Pharaoh in the life of slavery. And when we accept Christ and we have eternal life, in him, it's like the promised land was to the Israelites. It's our promised land as we look forward to in, in, in our wilderness in this life. And yet, just like the Israelites who wanted to go back to Egypt, we sometimes, even as Christians, and we know that our salvation is sure, we want to run back to Egypt. We want to run back to the sin that we were saved from. The great hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. You know what the last stanza says in that great hymn? Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, O oh, take and seal it for the courts above. Here's my heart, O oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. We are prone to wander, Christian. And God gives us all we need to fight that wandering, that desire to go back to sin. God gives that to us. And we have looked at that extensively as we have journeyed through Romans chapter 6. Charles Allen calls me almost every week, and not to talk about the building. He calls to encourage his pastor, his shepherd. He's done that as long as I've known him. He's been a member here. And he will call me, and this week I'm excited about the building. And he wants, I say, how are you doing, Charles? What do you got to tell me? I'm just going to tell you how great the Lord is. Oh, gosh. Okay. <laughs> but the week before that, we were having a conversation like we always do. We have a God Talk conversation. And he was, we were talking about sin. We were talking about the Romans 6 series. At least I was thinking about that as he was giving this illustration to me. He says, you know, Pastor, when I moved into my house some 10 years ago, I worked really hard to get the lawn looking good really hard i work in it i made sure there were no weeds in it i treated it and i took care of it and i had a immaculate lawn but guess what happened over time when i stopped tending to my yard 
when I stopped weeding it and getting and fertilizing it, getting stuff, it didn't wasn't as beautiful as when I first created it. And he said, "Isn't sin that way in our lives? Isn't it the same way? We come to Christ and and we weed it and we fertilize it and we make it grow, but then some of you here this morning, your 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 yard is full of weeds spiritually. You stop plucking them out." You stop fertilizing, you stop watering it. You, it, it. It's okay, it's just my yard. It's okay, I'm saved, I'm born again. Christ does not want you to live a life that's not victorious. That's what the world tells us. That's not what God tells us. If you're a Christian here this morning, you want to have victory over sin. You want it over your life. If you don't, I would question whether you're a believer or not. If you're just no desire to... To kill the sin that be killing you? Then question yourself this morning. Have I truly repented? Have I given it all up for Christ? Have I denied myself, taken up my cross, and followed Him? When we walk in righteousness, we will glorify our Savior. The one who loved you enough to go to the cross while you were still an ungrateful rebel. The song this morning. I can tell you, I'm going to make a confession. When I read the lyrics, I loved the song, but when I heard them practice it, I thought, oh my gosh, this is going to be terrible. They spent weeks trying to get, the, yeah, that's right, I'm going to be honest with you. <laughs> I, but this morning, oh my gosh, Pastor Cal, Gina, worship team, it was beautiful. The work that you guys did is, is, was outstanding. The praise that came from from this church today as we sang that those those doctrines of truth i hope you were paying attention i want to get up and preach right in the middle of them singing <laughs> beautiful you did we did preach it was preached to us why because we think of the glories of god and what he saved us from and we were rebels and some of you are proud to still put that rebel label on yourself you still are proud to, to be independent from what God would have you do in your life. You haven't yielded to him. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow him daily. You are his slave as Paul has so much preached to us through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. When we sin, we dishonor the Lord. A holy life glorifies him. Sin disrupts fellowship with the Lord. Since Christians' chief aim is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever, you should want to have victory over sin, not live in it. So how do we gain consistent victory? How do we do that over the sin that so easily entraps us and ensnares us? How does that happen? Our text this morning provides some solid answers to this crucial question. In future months we'll get to chapter 8 in chapter 8 Paul gives us an explanation of the Holy Spirit's role in keeping us from sin but he does here give us some helpful strategies for the daily battle that we will face against temptation and sin so would you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word here this morning Romans chapter 6 as we close out the chapter reading from verse 19 through 23 I am speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you then having from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you have honor, excuse me, you, you have your, be, uh, I'm sorry, these, these new glasses, <laughs> back to verse 22. But now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you have your benefit leading to sanctification and the end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gracious gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Oh, Father, you are so gracious and so merciful to us. 
While yet we were sinners, your son died for us. And Father, you desire for us to live lives that are holy and pleasing. May that, may that be the desire of my heart today. May it be the desire of your people's heart today. And Father, as a mere man stands before your people to present your truth, I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would move in your people. And Father, if there's one here that's struggling with sin, Father, a sin that they cannot let go of, Father, that they would repent of that sin, seek you, Father. For the one who does not know you as Savior, Lord, I beg, I beg them today. Today is the day of salvation. I pray, Father, that you make blind I see dead men or dead women alive in you, hearts of stone to hearts of flesh, Father. May all of this be done for your glory. In Jesus' precious name, amen. So I, I've, I've got these transitional glasses, and the bottom of my text went like this. <laughs> Thought I got used to them, but obviously not yet. So this morning, we have one of two masters. One of two masters. Either we are a slave to sin. If you're here this morning and you don't know Christ, you're a slave to sin. If you're his and you belong to him, you are my brother and sister, and we are slaves to righteousness. Verse 19, we begin with slaves to sin. I'm speaking in human terms, Paul writes, because of the weakness of your flesh. We, we need to understand this is not a rebuke of the church in Rome. He's not saying they're full of sin. He's not telling them that. When we think of flesh, we think of doing things in the flesh. Paul is saying that because of their spiritual immaturity, their spiritual children. And that's why he says it to them. He's talking about them being weak. As, as you came to Christ, the, the, you know, when, when, you, when you first come to Christ and the only thing you know is uh, you were a sinner and God saved you, you don't know the difference between the Old Testament and New Testament, you couldn't tell me what Paul did or what Paul didn't do. You don't know any of the stories of the Bible, right? You were children in the faith. You were on the bottle. You were getting the milk. And then as you matured, you went to solid food. And now, and now as you mature in the faith, you should want meat and potatoes. Sorry, you vegetarians. You should want meat and potatoes. You want doctrine and you want theology. You want to glorify God. You don't want to have a childlike faith in the sense that it never grows. That childlike faith brought you to saving faith. But now you should be maturing in your faith. And so he's telling them that he is using everyday language and an illustration to share a spiritual truth here. He's saying, in effect, as frail human beings or as mere men and mere women, we need analogies and illustrations of spiritual truth. But often these are even imperfect to try to relay God's truths. As I said last week, the Roman Empire was full of slaves. Paul realizes that many of his readers are slaves and that slavery is an imperfect analogy and that there are many vile aspects of human slavery that do not apply to our relationship with the Lord. And you may have even thought that yourself. What we have seen of slavery and the, the heinous acts where one man declares that he would own another human being and how they treat those human beings. And so we, we, that kind of comes into mind. But then we have to realize that that's not exactly what the preacher is at all. God is our benevolent king. And we love him and we serve him willfully. But the, that's a great analogy that the scriptures use that God wants you to understand. Slavery means that you have a master. And when before we came to Christ, we were the ma our master was Satan. And now our master is God, a benevolent God who loves us and cares us and will cause you no harm that does not suit his divine purpose for your life. Because we have to be careful with that. We have to be careful. We tell people, God has a wonderful plan for you in your life. Well, that wonderful plan may mean that you die a martyr. But we don't want to hear that. You know what the wonderful plan I want for my life is I want a full bank account. I want a nice new truck. I want a really big house. I want a vacation wherever I want to. I want to be able to do everything I want to. That's my worldly, fleshly desire. But as a Christian, 
we understand that we lay all that aside. And that does not fulfill us or sustain us. Our desire is to serve the one who saved us. In 19, as we continue, for just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and lawlessness, leading to further lawlessness. This describes every believer's former unconverted life. Again, we saw two weeks ago, your members here is a reference to our whole being, our mind, our soul, everything that our ears, our eyes, our heart, our hands, our feet, everything that we have is affected and carried out by who we belong to. Lawlessness is our previous life. If you don't know Christ today, you live in a life of lawlessness. And you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. I obey the law. Well, I may speed a little bit, but I obey the law for the most part. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about you, you have denied the one who sent his son to die in your place. And so therefore, you're living in, in almost if you, you had blinders on. And you're walking through life and you don't see anything, I don't want to see anything bad, I don't want anything negative, it's just me and my, my world and, and I'm the center of my universe. You know one thing that happened when you came to Christ was you stopped being the center of your own universe. That's hard for us, some of us, to, to grasp. It's not about us. When you came to saving faith it wasn't even about you. It was about God's glory. He saved you for His glory. And so we got to remember what we were saved from, and we should be giving thanks that we are saved from lawlessness that was in our previous life and disobedience to the law of God. And when we were un unbelievers, we walked on a slippery slope, going from bad to worse to awful. We weren't getting better. We were not getting better. We could not do anything on our own to get better. Oh, well, the world sees people and say, well, look at how that person is achieved and how successful they are and what a wonderful person they are. Inside, their soul is dark and black. And they serve their father, the devil. Remember what your life was like before you came to Christ, Christian? Do you remember what it was like? Always chasing the next thing to make you happy? Looking for the next relationship, the next adventure or vacation? The new car the new house always chasing the elusive high life you were slave to sin and could never know true joy peace and truth that you could never be quenched you, you ever wonder why people are never quenched when you read about these celebrities that commit suicide and they and you look at them and you think they have all the money in the world they've got houses all over the world they they have they have everything that the world would want and they're miserable they're miserable why are they miserable? Because they don't have Christ. Why can that family in Africa that lives in a hut and he has to go out, the thing about the equator, the sun rises at 7, sits, sets at 7. 12 hours, you got 12 hours of daylight, 12 hours of darkness. They go out and they work. It looks like it would 2,000 years ago. A man working his field with a, with a, with a, a hoe or a spade wood big wood handle on it and just digging in the dirt to put potatoes in the ground to put something in the ground so his family can eat and yet the joy in their lives because they know christ and we get upset because our electricity goes out for an hour we get up upset because we don't have wi-fi on our phone think about the things that 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 we should be so grateful for, and yet we complain. We almost like we're still slaves of sin. Paul reminds the church in Rome that they were not remaining in the same place. You were children. You're not, you're not that. And you don't need to stay in the same place. As unbelievers, they had become more sinful, more decadent. Their lawlessness, their sin was leading to more sin. This very thing is happening in our own country right now. The very thing that Paul is warning the church in Rome about in chapter 1 is evident in our country. In the, in the 60s was the beginning of the sexual revolution. The culture of our country began to change. No need to get married, to be intimate. According to the Pew, Pew Research, 71% of Americans over 18, 18 were married in 1960. 71%. You know what that was in 2020? 46%. 
that's a significant cultural shift in the way people look at the way they live. Secondly, first we had the sexual revolution. Secondly, we had the homosexual revolution, and it became normalized in 1996. Now, this is 1996. I know for us old people that it's not too long ago. For you young people, that's like that was last century. But 1996, was that 28 years ago? No. Yeah. 28 years ago, 27% of Americans thought gay marriage should be allowed. 27%. In the year 2023, 73% of Americans think gay marriages are okay. The Western world celebrates Pride Month this month. Think about that for a moment. Pride. These people want us to rejoice with them as they proudly declare their debauchery, their immorality, their sin, as they shake their fist against the Holy God. That's what they want you to do in Pride Month. Do you realize they identify themselves with a sexual activity? That's what they identify. How do we identify ourselves? With Christ. Christ. And yet, the Western world celebrates this and demands that you celebrate it as well. Americans today would feel more at home in Sodom and Gomorrah than they would inside a Christian church. Thirdly, we see depraved minds, the transgender movement. Let me remind you of this, just this beginning. This is just the beginning because I want you to look at the stats I gave before. When I talked about in 1996, only 27% of Americans thought it was okay for gays to get married. Now it's 73%. In 2022, 38% of Americans thinks a person can change their sex if they think they are a man trapped in a woman's body and vice versa. You you think that number is going to go down? Of course not. It's going to go continue to go up. Fourth, we think about the legalization of marijuana and other mind-altering drugs that are out there. You put all this and what you have is you have Sodom and Gomorrah. You have a nation that has turned its back on God, has shaken its fist at God, has stuck its tongue out at God, and tells you that you are the intolerable one. Christian, you will, you will face persecution in your lifetime. There are, some of you already have, at your work, at your school. You younger people, you will face worse persecution than it's going on today. It will not be tolerated. You will, what I say on a pulpit on Sunday mornings, will be de- what I just pronounced to you would be called hate speech by some already. Why is that? Because you have to have transgender people sitting in pulpits, staying in pulpits where churches have put transgender people in pulpits, put homosexuals in pulpits that declare that that's not what God's word says. So what do you think is going to happen when you get arrested for a hate crime and you say the Bible says this, and they bring in their prosecuting witness, line them up one right after another who declares that is not what the Bible says. With all of that, you are not to hate them or despise them. You're to love them and share the gospel with them. Because, folks, we were no different than them. No different than the transgender person. No different than the homosexual. No different than the drunkard. No different, because some of us were all of those things, some of those things. And yet God in his mercy and grace saved you from that. And with that, we need to understand that we need to live lives that are holy and pleasing to him. See, the unbeliever, as, as we don't have time to do it today, I was going to read from 18 through 28. Go back and read it again. Romans 1, 18 through 28. And plug in what I just told you with those verses as you meditate on this sermon this week. The further lawlessness we're talking about here is true of every unbeliever to one extent or another. It's like a cancer that reproduces itself until the whole body is destroyed. Sin reproduces itself until the whole person is destroyed spiritually. And hell is the destination of all of the slaves of sin. Look at verse 20. 
For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. You here, who is he talking to? He was talking to the church. He's talking to you and I. For when we, you want to say that? Look at yourself. When Mark was a slave of sin, I was free in regard to righteousness. We all were once slaves of sin. The truth that everyone in the world began as a slave of sin and continues to live as such if they are not without Christ. If you are here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, if you've not repented of your sins, trusted in Christ, you are still a slave of sin. But even those who have been born again, we were once slaves of sin previous to our conversion. We know what it's like to be that person. There was not one of us who was righteous. No, not one of us that did good work. Not one of us desired to come after God. Not one of us. You and I, in our pride, said, I don't need God. I'll create a God in my own image. Whatever suits me, yeah, I believe there's a God, and, or I believe there's somebody up there, or everything works out for good. No, it only works out for good for those who love the Lord or are called according to His purpose. Why? Why? Why was that? Po why did we do that? Because we served our master. It does not matter if you think of yourself a spiritual person or a religious person or that you were raised up in church with Christian parents, went to Christian school, had Christian friends, You've memorized Bible verses as a child. You're still a slave of sin, according to the Bible, if you haven't repented of those sins. You can be the most religious person that you know and know more than anybody else knows about the Bible, but if you haven't repented of your sins, you're still a slave to sin. You see, before we came to Christ, our entire former life was lived in slavery. Our mind, heart, and will we're all enslaved to our sinful desires that's why it says by grace you were saved because you were slaves in bondage you couldn't free yourself when was the last time that you saw an image of a slave with with ball and chain around his ankle chained to the wall slave to the master and he could free himself he couldn't do it you were that same way you were slave to sin. You didn't realize it. You didn't look at yourself as being a bondage, but you were. And God, by His grace, through the Holy Spirit, regenerated you and gave you the faith to believe in His Son. The scales were removed from your eyes. The heart of stone turned to heart of flesh. The dead man that you were, the dead woman that you were, you breathed life spiritual life into your body at that point we need to understand just how dominated we worldly were by sin and dear one if you are here today and you do not know jesus as lord and savior you are dominated by sin and sin cracks the whip and you obey every lustful desire every sinful thing that you do it's the whip of satan cracking and you're obedient to it christians we once also lived under this dominant rule of sin and it was manifested more so in some than others we know that for various reasons but the the person who is sitting in the penitentiary for committing a rape and the man or woman who is a fortune 500 company or is very successful in their in the trade or field that they're in and raised a family and was a good person according to his neighbors and you go to his funeral and what you hear is he loved the fish he loved to hunt he loved his children he loved his grandchildren he loved to do this and he loved to do that you know what you don't hear at those funerals he loved the lord above everything else he loved the lord he faithfully served at his local body didn't look for recognition he was a man who gave of his first fruits unto the Lord. He was a man who forgave others. He was a man who loved the Lord. He loved others. He was obedient to God's word. That's, when, when I preach a funeral of a believer that I know and love, and, and I've done that far too many times, 
There's joy in my heart, though, as I know that brother or sister is in the presence of the Lamb. And they suffer no longer. They don't look down on us. They don't get wings. They're not flying around you this summer as a butterfly. They're in glory where each of us will be one day. And so the good person here today, and you look at the penitentiary person, that person is no less or no more guilty than you are. And you will spend eternity in hell along with them. And matter of fact, that person comes to the Lord in the penitentiary for raping, murdering children, torturing people. And God calls him to salvation, that person will be in glory. And I know that's hard for you this morning who don't know Christ. But that's the message of the gospel that he is there to save all of us, the worst of sinners, which I am. Verse 21, therefore, what benefit were you then having from the things, from these things of which you are now ashamed? Benefit from the Greek word can be translated as fruit, advantage or profit. What profit was it to you? What fruit did it bring in your life? What advantage to it did you have when you did all these sinful things? Paul is referring to the deeds of the flesh, which we did before we were born again, of which we are now ashamed. Ashamed, Christian. You should never boast on your sin before you came to Christ. You have confessed and turned away from sins in which you once lived before you came to Christ. Paul says believers are ashamed of those things. As a believer, things you once loved before you came to saving faith in Christ, you now hate. And the things you once hated, you now love. The things of which you once glor uh, glorified of your, in your life, you now are ashamed of them. This is the distinguishing mark of a new birth. Again, as I've used this illustration over and over, it's that super highway in your life. You come to before you come to Saving Faith, you're a good person. You drive down a eight-lane uh, super highway, and you're not breaking the law. You're not murdering people. You're not raping people, but... So you're driving down this road to hell. And all of a sudden, God saves you. And you realize that, whoa, part of my salvation is that I must die to self. And so that lanes of your highway get smaller and smaller, not because the preacher tells you, not because the Sunday school teacher tells you, not because your mom and dad tell you. It's because you study God's word and you realize what is pleasing and holy to him you don't want to do. And so your road gets narrow and narrow on your sanctification process till you're on that narrow path. Verse 21, for the end of those things is death. Death here refers to eternal death, eternal punishment, and eternal torment in hell forever. The outcome of any life without Christ is the second death, which includes death throughout the ages to come. This death is the just punishment for sin that everyone deserves from a holy God. If you're born again, this, des this describes from what you have been delivered from. Read that to yourself. For the end of these things is death. Glory to be God, I've been freed from that. You were once enslaved to sin before you came to salvation in Jesus Christ. And now, the second point, you are slaves of righteousness. Verse 19b, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. Paul is describing a process, not a once and for all decision that catapults us into a state of total sanctification where sin no longer tempts us. We will always be tempted. Some wrongly teach that if you will just learn the secret of letting go and let God, everything will be okay. Your Christian life will be one of effortless, continual fellowship with Christ. You are in a battle, Christian. You are told to put on the spiritual armor of God. You are told to die to self daily. You are told that you will be persecuted for his namesake. You will be hated for his namesake. It is a spiritual battle. All through the New Testament, the epistles use warrior language. Stand firm. Fight the good fight. You're, call, you're not called to a life of leisure. You're not told to let go and let God. God saves you and he, for a purpose and for a reason. Some of you don't even serve your local body. The Bible tells us that in, later on in Romans 12 that we're called to serve one another, not to serve ourselves. 
You were given spiritual gifts. Those gifts are to be used by the body. Things don't function if the body doesn't work together. It's not letting go and let God like He's going to take care of the problem. It's not biblical. Sanctification is a lifelong process that requires daily battle, daily battle against sin and temptation. When you are tempted, dear one, let me give you a really simple elementary. This would be, this would be JK. No, this would be toddler stuff. When you feel like you're being tempted Go to God and say, lead me not into temptation. Meditate on that. Lead me, God. Lead me. Let me grab your hand and walk with you so I will not fall to this temptation. Lead me, God, me. I'm struggling right now. Lead, don't lead me into, I don't want to do it, God. The flesh wants to. And it's drawing me. Please, God. Please. I'll make you this promise. You pray that prayer. You meditate on it. And that lust, that desire that you have in your heart, heart will flee from you. Greater is he that is in you that is in the world. You have the power of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. The same Holy Spirit that Paul had. The same Holy Spirit that gave Peter the courage to preach after he denied the Savior. He indwells in you. God wants his best for his children. Don't fight him. Yield to him. Go to him. If you are a Christian, you are no longer slaves of sin. We now obey our king. Gina gave me a little sticker today. I love these little stickers. See, right here. I work for the king. You work for the king. You were saved. You belong to him. You don't work for anybody else. Dr. Mar Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote this. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote this. He did write this. That's what I get for banging on a stupid thing. <laughs> Bear with me for just one second as I reboot it. <laughs> this is that awkward silence. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote this, As you go on living this righteous life and practicing it with all your might and energy and all your time, you will find that the process that went on before in which you went on from bad to worse and become viler and viler is entirely reversed. You will become cleaner and cleaner and purer and purer and holier and holier and more and more conform to the image of the Son of God. Close quotes. That's the truth of it, Christian. When we are in sin, we go down, 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 down. When we understand that we belong to Christ, we go up, 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 up in our choices. Look at verse 22. But now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you have your benefit leading to sanctification and the end eternal life. In verse 22, we see the new slave. We became a new master at that moment of our regeneration. But now, when he says but now, it marks a stark contrast from a believer's previous spiritual condition. This indicates a dramatic change in our relationship to God for our His forever Excuse me, you and I are his forever. And he has work for me and you to do. And he has blessings for you. He desires goodness to follow you. I was sharing with the pastors this week. I heard a historian, uh, excuse me, a, a, a Hebrew scholar. And I found it interesting Pastors that I was telling you this story. I went and I told them I was going to do a word search before I shared this with the church. So Psalms 23. We all know that. Beloved Psalm. And so it says in Psalm 23, 
that surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. You who have legacy Bibles, turn to there real quick. Turn to it. Because I found this fascinating. Because you know what this scholar said about the word follow? It's at the end of the chapter. It's at the end of the chapter of verse 23. You know when we say follow? He says this is not a strong enough word in the Hebrew. You know what the uh, Legacy Bible translates as? Pursues. Pursues. You realize God isn't following you like a little toddler. He's not following you like a little puppy dog. It's figuratively as you would the hounds of heaven are pursuing you and chasing you down to give you goodness and mercy. God is pursuing you, Christian. He's just not following you. His desire for you is to live a life that's holy and pleasing to Him. Surely, David says, goodness and long, uh, love kindness will pursue me all the days of my life. Christian, the Holy Spirit that had and dwells in you, the God who saved you, Jesus who rose from the dead, desires for you to have goodness and mercy and love kindness in your life. Do you live like that, Christian? Do you live that victory in your life, or do you always run around moping and complaining and whining because you don't get your way? Or are you just so thankful for what God has done in your life? That you just want to serve the one that loves you. And when Paul says you have been freed from sin, and he does not mean that we have been freed from all practices of sin. You and I still sin. As much as we hate that, but Paul means that we have been freed from the reign of sin, the dominion of sin, the mastery that sin once possessed in our lives. We have been set free from the rule of sin in our lives. The redemption. Remember back in Romans 3.24? through the blood of Jesus Christ, means that he entered into the slave market. He went into the slave market of sin in this world and paid the price to purchase and deliver you and I from the bondage of sin. He paid the price. His death on the cross. Jesus died in order to set us free from our former slavery. We now belong to him. You know, it, if we can get this in our heads that it's not about us and it's all about him and that I'm not free to do whatever I want to, it's, it'll be much easier to obey him. You remember when you were an adolescent? For some of us, that was a real long time ago. And it was really hard when, our, when we finally, you know, when mommy and daddy used to tell us things, it was like we just wanted to do them. At least my kids wanted to do them when they were little. But as soon as they became teenagers, some critter in her room <laughs> and they were no, no, no longer the loving child that oh mommy daddy love you whatever you say right it was like I don't want to do that that's dumb you can't make me do that I'm not your slave no but I put bread on your plate and a roof over your head I know they got tired of hearing that one but that's what we act like sometimes we act like spoiled little teenagers we don't appreciate what God's done for us all that he has given to us. The command of verse 19 in chapter 6, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness leading to sanctification. Rest on the fact of 618. And to have been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness, which is again repeated in chapter 6, verse 22. But now have been freed from sin and enslaved to God. The truth is that God freed you from sin and made you a slave of righteousness in Jesus Christ. This is our new position in Christ. God did, not, God did it for you through His grace and His power. It is true of all Christians, just not the spiritually mature ones. Every Christian is on the same level playing field. As Paul repeatedly stated in chapter 6, verses 2 through 8, in Christ all have died to sin. It means all in the Greek, just like it does in English. All of us have died to sin and have been raised to newness in life. Whether you're a brand new believer 
or you've been a believer for 50 years of your life or longer, we were raised to newness in life. Therefore, be what you are now, a new creation. Live in light of your new position. J.C. Ryle writes this in his commentary. Quote, to be born again is to enter into a new existence. It is to have a new mind, a new heart, and new views, new principles, new tastes, new affections, new likes, new dislikes, new fears, new, new joys, new sorrows, new love to things that you once hated, new hatred to things you once loved, new thoughts of God, new thoughts of yourself, new thoughts of the world, new thoughts of the world to come, and new life in Christ, close quotes. There cannot be a more dramatic alteration to what we once were, to what we have become. God changed us. God changed us. I conclude with verse 23. I told Kathy, I said, do you think they let me preach for another hour once I got to verse 23? She said, no. <laughs> for the wages of sin is death. But the gracious gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This verse closes out this convicting chapter with a warning and a promise. The warning, the word wages, simply means the payoff. That's what it means, payoff. Wages are the opposite of a gift. The person who is in this works-based system receives wages or payback for what he's done he receives from his master exactly what he has earned and deserved spiritual death is earned spiritual death is earned they receive the wages for their sin if you're here this morning you don't know christ you will receive the wages of your sin which is hell and damnation forever it's just it's rightful compensation for a life that is characterized by sin which is every life apart from God. There is no good news until you know what the bad news is. The darker the bad news, the brighter the good news. You should not want the, this punishment that you deserve. If you're sitting here this morning and, and you're going, I've heard this and I've heard this and I'm ignoring this this morning, pay attention, please. Nothing else I've said today. You do not want for what you have been working and earning your whole life for right now. Revelation chapter 20. Verse 11 says, Then I saw a great white throne and him who sits upon it, and from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. Then I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from these things which were written in the books according to their deeds. Those who die without Jesus as Lord will get justice. The Christian gets mercy. That's a promise we have from God. But the gracious gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord is how he finishes this all out. As I said, I could preach a whole sermon on these two verses. This is Paul's great climax to chapter 6. Jesus Christ is the only way from sin to righteousness, from damnation to salvation, from eternal life to eternal death. Steve Lawson said this, quote, If we cannot worship God after hearing this, this verse, what I just read to you. If we cannot worship God after hearing this, then we must be lost. The noose of condemnation that was once around our neck has been removed by the hangman. By the grace of God, we have been set free through, the, through uh, faith in Christ. If we have received this grace, we must live for him. Close quote. Do you know Christ? Do you know how much God the Father loves you? Let me close with this illustration. It was so powerful. I had never, I've never heard it put like this. A man was interviewing a, a Christian man. He said, I never understood. I never understood how much God loved me until my son was laying dying in a hospital bed. He said his brothers and sisters came to say goodbye to him. His mother sitting, grieving, holding his hand. We could do nothing. I would have given God anything. My life. Anything. Everything I possessed, everything I owned, just saved my son. And my son died. And it was at that moment I realized how much God loved me. 
Because God had the power to save his son. He put his son on the cross. And as we sang it, that last hymn we sang today, Christ who hung on that tree and he took our place. And if you were his father, if your son was being crucified, your earthly son was being crucified, what would you not do to get him off that cross? What would you not do, Father, to save us, your son? And yet God withheld that that he surely did not want to have to do, but he did because of his grace and his mercy for us. He watched his son die on a cross as he poured out his anger against your sin and my sin, and he put it on his son. Not only did he not save him from dying, he didn't save him from his own wrath that he placed upon his son. And you sit here today who do not know him as Lord and Savior. And you mock him with your disbelief. You would turn your back and march to hell in front of the one who desires that you come to saving faith. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, fully man and fully God who knew no sin and became sin for us on that cross, who suffered, died, and was buried and rose on the third day. And God said, believe in him and you shall have eternal life. Confess it with your mouth that he is Lord and you are my child. Dear one, tomorrow, as Charles Spurgeon said, is Satan's day. Today is the day of your salvation. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Christians, this morning we have gathered and we have worshipped the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We have rejoiced at what God has done in this place and, and, and paying this debt down. And as we begin the next chapter of the Go, Gather, Grow here at Grace Harvest, we don't know what God's going to do, but we must be faithful who is calling in each of our lives. You were a slave to sin and now you're a slave to righteousness. Christian, you may have to confess before your Lord and Savior this very hour or this very moment that you haven't been living that way. Oh, we're so thankful that we have a Savior that will listen and forgive. But dear one, if you don't know him today, I, I'm not trying to manipulate you. The Holy Spirit is the one that will draw you to, but if he is drawing you, don't turn away and march to hell. Christian, I don't know how God's working in your life. Some of you have been visiting for a while. If, if God is saying, this is the place that I, I want you to be then, and to serve here, you come. You grab this preacher by the hand. As we've had, uh, in the past two weeks, we've had two ladies join our church. God could be speaking to you a way I can't imagine today. You need to get that straight with him before you leave this place. Some of you have never followed the Lord and believers' baptism. You know, ob obedience, delayed obedience is disobedience. God tells us that we are to confess before man, so we, and we do that it, in our baptism. We are saved by his grace, and baptism doesn't save us, but it's the first command that we're given. I pray that however God is working in your life, that you will respond. Father, your mercy we do not deserve. Your grace we do not deserve. And yet, Father, it flows through us by the power of the Holy Spirit that indwells in us. May we, Father, live to bring you glory. And Father, may the one who does not know you today, Father, would you, would you do a modern day miracle here? I ask this in the precious name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You come as the Lord leads, as Pastor Cal leads us in song. Amen.